back together. Amen. I miss seeing you guys. <laughs> we were just talking how weird it is to try to try to do a service with no one in the room. And uh, it's, it's so good for us to be together today. Let's never take it for granted. Let's continue to sing together. I want to move so you can move. Come and do what only you can do. I want to live in expectation of your kingdom breaking through. Of your kingdom breaking through. It's in my hands. My hands are open. My heart is free. This morning, such a great song. You know, Becca, she has a couple of twins, and this is that is their favorite song, and they tell me that often. They're six six years old, right? Six years old, yeah. Six years old, the sweetest little kids. Let's go to the Word together. We're in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So the word of the Lord. Notice it says this, when you were dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. There was a time where we walked in complete deadness. I remember those days for myself. I remember walking in complete deadness. I was just numb, hopeless. I really did not look forward to tomorrow because there was nothing to look forward to. That is the deadness. 
I felt the depth of my sin. Maybe you have felt that way as well. That's why when we come to Christ, Christ doesn't rehabilitate us. He doesn't make us better. No, we die and we are reborn. We are made a new creation in him and we are made alive. Do you realize there is no other name in history where words like this speak of things like this? It's only in the name of Jesus. It's only in his name that we are made alive. Let's think about these things today. Let's reflect upon the passage as we prepare our hearts. Father, we come before you today as we read your word and we realize it is in Christ alone that we are saved. There is no other name under heaven which man must be saved other than that name. So Lord, as we gather, we gather in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that as we gather, just our love for you and our love for one another in complete unity is pleasing to you. It's our desire to praise you, to worship you, Lord, to lift up hearts of gratitude, Lord, to hear from your word, Lord, and to be encouraged, for our souls to be refreshed, Lord, that we might sense your nearness. This week has been hard for, for many folks, and Lord, I pray today would be a day of rest as they reflect their hearts and minds on you. Strengthen them, Lord. Strengthen them in your word. As we gather, we continue to sing all for your purpose and all for your glory. And it's in your name, Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's continue to sing together. Sing this with me. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
pray together. Lord, we love you and thank you that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die for us. Thank you, Father. Not just to change our destination, but yet to bring us into a kingdom that will never end, that is all-powerful. Underneath your rule, in step with your spirit. And Lord, we desire to be the children of God as we walk with you. We desire to walk under the full benefits of your kingdom and all that you give us. Lord, we lay our concerns before you. Lord, I pray those that are hurting, Lord, that they would truly breathe in, that they would experience your peace. Lord, for those that are estranged, that there would be reconciliation. For those that are sick, we pray for your healing power and touch. Lord, you tell us that if we ask for bread, you won't give us a stone. And Lord, we come to you and we just ask. How about right where you are? just in the quietness of your heart. Just ask of the Lord. You've worshiped him, now just ask. Whatever your burden is, ask for it to be relieved. Whatever your need is, ask it to be met. Lord, as as prayers are all around the room, as we're speaking directly to you, Lord, we, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for this moment. Lord, we pray that as we open up the Bible, Lord, you give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And Lord, we would discover more truths about you and us. Lord, that we might live in the victory that you promised. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you would, open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, and we will do a quick overview of Luke and Acts and how they join together. I'm excited about the fact that we're starting this series in the book of Acts. And by the way... Today's the first message in the book of Acts. We'll be in chapter 1, starting in verse 1. And we are going to go to the very end of the book. And we believe here that God is the one who speaks, and He speaks perfectly through the Bible. And as we explain it, apply it, and illustrate it, we all learn how to read the Bible for ourselves. That way, when you meet with God, God is speaking to you through the Word as this is just the way it works. It's just the way it works. God speaks to you and me through the Word of God, and as we adjust our hearts and our priorities and the rhythms of our life, God becomes more real and more powerful, and we hear His voice more clearly. So that's how all this works. But as we go into the book of Acts, we'll be, gosh, we've got the first 20 sermons all outlined out. It's going to go for a while, and then the next 20 or so, and I'm not preaching all of these today, so you can, you'll get to go home and eat your pot roast or whatever you got cooking uh, but we'll probably end up next year sometime. Next, uh, no, uh, this is 2023, right? I hadn't seen you guys in a year. Um, we will probably up in next November, December is when we'll land this plane, but I'm excited about it. Verse one, and this is Luke speaking. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus. Theophilus was the man that he was writing to. He wrote the gospel of Luke to Theophilus, where he says, O oh, Theophilus. We don't really know who Theophilus is. We know that possibly as somebody who funded his missionary journeys in the later part of Acts, as you will see. It could be somebody that he actually worked for. He was a very gifted man in so many different ways. Um, It could be just a nomenclature for Theos, God, and lovers, lovers of God. It could be just to the body of Christ that loves God. So we don't know the actual individual. We do believe that uh, Luke, in, in writing this book, It's a combination with the book of Luke because he refers to his other writings, which is Luke, uh, as Luke and Acts are really one story, to tell you the truth. Uh, Luke and Acts, if you know much about the Bible, in fact, you probably already know this, the Bible is divided into two sections. You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament. You have the Old Covenant and the way that God worked with man and his economy and his system of working with the hearts of man. And in the New Covenant, it's a whole new dimension because of the Spirit of God that's come inside of your heart and in your life, and now we are the church made up of the body of Christ. And so there's a big transition. In the New Testament, you have what's called the Gospels, and they are history books, and there are other types of literature. There's didactic or teaching books, which would be epistles. There's poetry, which would be like Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. You have prophecies, which would be like the book of Revelation, certain sections in Matthew, the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, etc., And so, but when we look at Luke and Acts, they are history books. 
And that's what Luke is writing. In fact, Luke and Acts, the two books together, make up 25% of your New Testament. So it's very significant that we look at these two things. And I want to look at how they dovetail in together so beautifully. I want us to see that the Bible was written over different millennia, over 66 different books with many, many different authors, written to many, many different kinds of people, but directed by the Holy Spirit of God and has a content and has a story throughout that just is so beautiful. And when you see it falling together, your faith and confidence in the Word of God just skyrockets because you know this isn't just any other book, right? I don't know if you've read just any other book. It doesn't sound like this. It doesn't speak like this. It doesn't work like this. It's completely different. So when you and I have our noses in this book and our minds and hearts are engaged, miraculous things are at foot and are there. So as he says, I wrote the first narrative, that's the Gospel of Luke, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. In fact, that's the content of the book of Luke. After he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. You know, he chose these disciples who he commissioned as apostles. And the, uh, these apostles were, are the ones that are sent. That's all that means. That's all apostle means is the sent ones. And they were sent to do the things that Jesus did under the influence of the Holy Spirit and its empowerment. And the book of Acts records that. So the first part. Luke, is the calling of the disciples and the training of disciples. Acts, the second part, which is the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit and the mission. And you and I are a part of that. Because actually, as you know, as you've probably read the book of Acts, it doesn't end. It's left with a dot, dot, dot at the end of chapter 28. And some have said we're actually living in Acts chapter 29. And so you and I, as disciples who are the sick ones, are to learn from this and to actually live it for what it means and what it says. So I just want to show you this connection between Luke and Acts. And I just have a little diagram. I got this over off of the uh, part of it, off of the overview Bible. And uh, it's, you, you can find it in many different formats, but it's basically a connection between Luke and Acts. And so on the left side of the map, you see the gospel of Luke and the things that happen. On the right side of that map, you see acts of the apostles by the beckoning of the Holy Spirit. And we see that there is uh, just a general idea of the two folding together. And when we look at Luke specifically, we look at him, who he was. He was a physician, very caring man, a man of details, a man who took... uh, incredible notes and kept them and reserved them and secured them for us. He eventually, after coming to know Christ, he possibly, more than likely, and you'll see this in a second, was a proselyte or a convert to Judaism. He knew the ways of the Jewish people inside and out. The way the book of Luke interacts with the scribes and the Pharisees, the Levites, the Sadducees, he knew that system very well. So he worked with Paul as Paul began to do the missionary journeys as well. And we'll see in the last part. More than likely, he was a Gentile. Um, He was well-versed in the scriptures. His aim of the gospel was to tell the story of Jesus. And when he starts in the book of Acts, before the falling of the Spirit, before all the things that take place, he says, I wanted you to know what Jesus began to do and to teach. And as a follower of the Lord, you and I need to know the life of Christ very, very well. We need to know the teachings of Christ very, very well. To claim him as Savior and not be interested in his life is a major disconnect. To say that I trust Jesus for all eternity, but yet I don't trust him for my daily life and daily living and the rhythms and the priorities is is hypocritical. And so as Jesus says, I want to tell you what he taught and what he did, because it is amazing. And when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke 
are very similar. They're called synonymous or the synoptic gospels. You've got John that is centered around seven signs, and these seven signs lead you to the conclusion that Jesus is Lord. And when you put all these together, you've got the life of Christ. In fact, several of you have like uh, what's called a harmony of the gospels. It's like one book of all the gospels put together in chronological order. And it's just a beautiful way to see the life of Christ. And so we all need to be students of the teachings of our master. Because he is a rabbi. You know what a rabbi is, right? A rabbi is a teacher. It's not just somebody that's at the front of the class that has a whiteboard or PowerPoints. That is an individual that poured his life into you. He would, he would walk with you day in and day out. And yes, you had head knowledge, but he would also teach you how to do certain things in life and uh, kind of shepherd your soul along the way. Very powerful. Jesus is our rabbi. He's our mentor. He's our teacher. He's our trainer. And so we get to know his life in a powerful way. Also to put the facts in order so that we know the order and the system by which Jesus taught and how we partake and we eat of that. But also just to make sure that we know things very, very clearly. But I also want you to see in the Gospel of Luke, it starts off in chapters 1 through 3. It starts off where it's speaking of his nativity or his birth. How a king came to earth in all of this humility. And not in, with the audience of thousands of servants worshiping him. But in the audience, audience of just a couple little shepherds. That after hearing the angels herald the truth of the good news and the Savior has been born, they gathered together in that little cave in Bethlehem, who, who would figure Bethlehem, and goes into that cave and they bow down and worship him, tells us a lot about the kingdom by which he rules. And it is all about the kingdom of God that you will see in the book of Acts. Your, the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom of God, of Jesus' rule upon your life. And uh, Pastor Scott read the verse today that we've been made alive into a new realm. And it's under the realm of the kingdom of God. And so as we go through the book of Luke and Acts, we will see this continued story of the message of Jesus, of Jesus' rule even in the even in our day, even right now. I mean, this is really what we're after, isn't it? For Jesus to rule our heart more comprehensively, more effectively in our day-to-day -day life because He is the master. He's the master of life. In Him is life. And if you want to experience life, it all is in Jesus Christ as Lord, and we see that. So the first three chapters of Luke talks about His beginning. And then it moves into his baptism to where the father said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I well pleased. And the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove lands on a tree. Then the Spirit casts him into the wilderness for 40 days for temptation. And then when he comes out, he starts his ministry of bringing the good news to all the outcasts. He goes, not staying in Jerusalem, but goes to the north to Galilee. And he goes to where the people just come out of the bushes, they come out of the hollers, and they just show up and they are following him. They see his miracles, they hear his teachings, and he's confounding the wise and the scribes and the Pharisees that can't keep up with him, and they're starting to wonder what's going on, but tens of thousands follow him. He's not in the ivory towers of the synagogues and the temple, but he's on the side of the hill on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and thousands of people show up and he begins to say things like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the hungry. And others will say, man, I know life is tough, but you are blessed once you receive this message and your whole life will be changed. And they were the common people. These were the people that had half their hair missing because of all the fights. They had scars on their faith. They have teeth missing. And that was just the women. That was just the average kind of person that was there. And so what we learn in the section between chapter 4 and chapter 9 is this incredible gospel invitation to join God's kingdom and have him save you, restore you, redeem you, resuscitate you, and bring you into life. And it's for everybody. And that's the message of Jesus. And then it moves on to this next section of Jesus and his teaching to where he's saying, Look, but if you want this kingdom of God, you've got to leave the kingdom of this world. 
if you want my ways, then you've got to lose your ways. In fact, if you start following me, it's going to get really dicey. In fact, since they hated me, they're going to what? Hate you. He said, so therefore, pick up your cross and follow me. I mean, what a statement. You know what a cross is, right? The cross is how they executed people in those days. And it was a horrible execution. And so what he's saying is, why don't you make it easy for them? Just go ahead and carry this thing wherever you go so that at any moment somebody can lay you on it, nail your hands, and kill you. And when he said that, most of his disciples left him. I mean, Sermon on the Mount, he had 10,000, then 5,000, then 500, then 120, then 70. Those are the numbers that are listed as the gospel progresses. And then it comes down when they've got like 70 there and Jesus saying, I'm going to Jerusalem in chapter 9. It says that his face was set like flint. I'm going to Jerusalem. They're saying, listen, they're going to kill you. And he says, yeah, if you come, they're probably going to kill you too. And then they all walked away and said, nope, I'm not that committed. And then the 12 were standing there and Jesus said this, do you want to walk away too? And they're like, I don't care who follows me. I'm going to Jerusalem. Do you want to go too? Do you want to leave? And they said, no, because you are the ones that have, you are the one who has the words of life. Where are we going to go? And that's a conviction and a commitment and a decision that each one of us has to make. Are we really going to be followers of Jesus when it comes down to it? When it comes down between me wanting my life my way, or do I really want to follow Jesus? Am I going to make all my moral decisions based on how I feel? Or am I going to do it based on what our king and master says, this is how you have life? It's a decision that we all make. When you are baptized, that's the decision that you are representing. That I am dying on the cross, I'm going into the grave, and I now raise a new person, and I follow Jesus. So the 12 followed him into Jerusalem. And of course, you know what happens next. He's confronted by the Pharisees and Sadducees and they they can't take it anymore. Uh, They convince the Romans to to come up with a mock trial in Antonio's fortress and things go bad for Jesus, so to say. He ends up taking his cross out to Golgotha. They nail him to that cross. They drop that cross in a hole and he is suspended between earth and heaven and he dies. And the disciples are incredibly sad. We made the decision to follow you, Lord. We gave up everything we had. And now he's dead. And they went and they hid. In fact, one of them, a guy named Thomas, said, look, I'm so down. I I heard he's risen from the dead, but there's no way I'm going to let myself hope again. I'm not going to get excited again until I put my hands in his hands, my hand in his side Until I see him and can touch him, I won't believe it. Next thing you know, Jesus comes walking through the wall as though his molecules separated and went through the molecules of the wall and got back together. And Jesus says, hey, Thomas, you will feel my hands? And those 11 disciples radically, radically changed the world. And so what we see happening in an incredible thing is that this idea of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke Spending 40 days in the wilderness is just like Moses spending those years in the desert. Moses was rejected by the Egyptians and he left, just like Jesus was rejected by the people and he left. But just like Moses, Moses came back again to deliver his people and Jesus did the same. He rose from the dead and Luke brings that out so beautifully. And if you have a Jewish mind that he's writing to and all the people are watching, they are seeing the Bible connect in so many places. As it says in Deuteronomy, there will be one who comes that is just like Moses, and bada boom, bada bang, here he is, just like Moses. The Bible said there'd be one that's just like David, and exactly like David, and it was powerful. It was very powerful. But then then as Luke brings up, he was just like Elijah. Well, what happened to Elijah? Why is he like Elijah? Elijah never died. Jesus rose from the dead, just like Elijah rose from the dead. And then he brings up the fact that he's just like Elisha. That should say Elisha. It's a, it's a misspelling. Remember that you got Elijah, who was, a, who was the prominent prophet, and his disciple came, out and it came up, and he trained him, and his name was Elisha. And at the going of Elijah, Elisha, what the characteristic of Elisha is the coming of the Holy Spirit upon him. Remember, the 
he, he said, I want a double proportion of what Elijah had, and he got it. And so this incredible picture of Elijah and Elisha, of the resurrection and the coming of the Spirit, leads us to what happens in the book of Acts, and it is incredible. This Jewish community, of course, the coming of the Spirit took place on the southern steps of the temple. It was right after the upper room that we'll read about in a couple, couple weeks when they prayed in the upper room. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. The promise that Jesus had promised was fulfilled and the church was born. And everything changed. But they were a Jewish community. They were baptized in the little mitzvahs, those little cleansing pools on those southern steps of, of the temple. Baptized 3,000 of them that day. They were a Jewish community. Many priests, many scribes came to know Christ. In fact, it says that in Acts chapter 6. It says that they would go back to the temple court and they would fill up that place and they had thousands. They say, how could they fit all in one temple? Well, the temple complex was five football fields big. Five football fields it was long and then wide, maybe like one and a half football fields, massive amount of people. And they would come up there and they would celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then you have an incredible plot twist that takes place with Stephen's uh, martyr. He was martyred. That was the first martyr of the church. And in Acts chapter 7, he's preaching this famous sermon. Stephen was a deacon, full of the spirit, full of wisdom. And when he preaches this message, it's kind of long, for as far as geography in the Bible, it takes up a whole page and a half of my Bible. But he brings up the whole Old Testament. And he's showing the Jewish community that Jesus is the Messiah that has always been promised. And he is here for you. In fact, he even says this, you must repent and believe before you enter into the kingdom of God and you experience his rule. And that's exactly what happened. But here's the real plot twist. And that is there's two of them the salvation of Paul. When Stephen is killed in Acts chapter 7, after his sermon, it says that they, they stone him. He sees into heaven. And it's a, we'll talk about that. It's a beautiful picture of what happens. But it says they, they, after he's dead, they take his garment and they lay it at the feet of a very uh, uh, a terrorist. His name is Paul. He is a, a part of the Sanhedrin, we assume. He's a Jewish leader. And he goes about killing the Christians. He led a campaign of terrorism. He created lots of widows in what he did. And one day, he was on his donkey going to Damascus, leaving the north side of Jerusalem. And on that road to Damascus, an incredible light came, and it blinded him. He falls to the ground, and he knows enough to know that it is somebody who is all-powerful, and he says, who are you, Lord? And the voice comes back in a very shocking way, and says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So Jesus equated himself with the body of Christ. When he was killing Christians, he was doing afflictions to Jesus, persecuting Jesus. And so Paul's conversion was a major plot twist. You didn't see it coming. And then the next one is the Gentiles coming to faith without becoming a Jew. We saw this with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. We see this in the debate of the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. And where they are saying that Paul comes up and many testify that they say this. They say, the gospel is open to everybody. You don't have to become a Jew. And they say, how do you know that? And he says, because the Spirit of God came on them. And they are doing the same things that we are doing. And it became incredible. But then right after that, Paul becomes the dominant character in the book of Acts at that point. And he goes on the first missionary journey. He travels through Asia, minor. Then the second journey means he goes on a big journey. He comes back. He regroups. Then he, then he goes again. Then he goes a third time. And when he gets back from his third journey, and those stories that we're going to cover are unbelievable. There are places that you can even visit today, and you can see where these things take place, like Miletus, and the way in which God did a miraculous thing then, and God is still doing a miraculous thing there now. I'll tell you some stories when we were there, some incredible things that God did. But then after he finished his third missionary journey, he was arrested. This time he was arrested by the Romans, and they meant it. 
And he pleaded and he convinced them, since he was a Roman citizen, to allow him to go back to Rome. And when he went back to Rome as a prisoner, he began to write much of his, many of his letters, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and many of these books while he was in prison that you have in your lap right now. And this is an incredible way that these two stories dovetail together in a perfect way. And it's just beautiful for you and I to see where we fit in this story. If we leave here today and you don't see where you fit in this, then, then I haven't done my job. And we haven't presented this the way the Lord wants this presented. Because the, like I said, the book of Acts doesn't close. It ends with a dot, dot, dot to be continued. And it's to be continued in your life and in my life and corporately as a body. And here's how we participate in this. Just as we saw how, God, how the Bible unfolds the truth through different pictures of the Old Testament, of Moses, of Elijah, and Elijah, and the many, many hundreds of other things, I want you to see in this first chapter, and kind of giving you an outline of what we're going to look at in the next couple of weeks, I want you to know that what it takes to experience the kingdom of God like this is, number one, you and I need to know about the teachings and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that in verse 1 and 2. You need to know what Jesus did. You need to know what Jesus said. He said to you, all who are weary and heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. He said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father unless he comes through me first. You know that he walked on water. You know that he rose the dead. You know that he was crucified. You know that he rose from the dead and you receive him as Lord and Savior because you know what he did and you know what he said and you say, I believe. And life changes. But also in chapter 2, you see this whole concept of the kingdom of God. He brings it up over and over in this first section. Luke is talking to you and me, and he says, it is the gospel of the kingdom. It is this idea of a rule, of a mastery, of a submission. I am a slave unto the Lord God Almighty, and that's a decision each of us make. That's how you become a follower of Christ. You surrender all. Have you ever heard that song? I surrender all. Maybe at a Billy Graham conference, your friends will wait, your family will wait, the buses will wait. Come to Christ now. That's the invitation. And that's what you know Jesus said so clearly but about the kingdom of God. You enter into the kingdom of God, his rule. But also, you are expecting the coming of the Holy Spirit. You see that. While they were together, verse 4, wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit or for the Father's promise. And so Jesus pours his Holy Spirit upon us. And we began to experience the supernatural life. Mainly, namely, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The gifts of the Spirit. You began to experience them on a, for the first time and on a whole nother level. It's, what, it's our sonship rights. It's our birthrights into the kingdom of God. When we call God our Father, He sends the Holy Spirit. And when we are born again, we are in Christ, but the Spirit also comes upon us. And it's really, really important. But next, with this expectation, comes a commitment to prayer. And I pray that in this year, we would, as a church, as individuals, as our staff has, made a commitment to meeting with God personally, individually, to where God can talk to you. He can rearrange your heart and you're, will, you're open to that. You're willing to, for that. In fact, you seek it. You open up the Bible. And as you read the Word of God, you allow the Word of God to change you and you respond to God and say, God, this is what you are saying in your Word, but my life doesn't match up. I repent and I want to be completely yielded to you. It might be that you're reading in the Word of God and, and there's been some great attacks against your soul in some form or a fashion and the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, begins to put salve and medicine upon your soul and you begin, that joy re is restored to your heart. It's an interaction. It's, it's also, that's what you do privately but corporately. Last Sunday, Luke was explaining to us how the Old Testament and New Testament are different 
in the avenue of even prayer. And how in the Old Testament, you see they would gather together, but one guy would pray like a priest or a prophet or a king. But then in the New Testament, you see all the people gathering together. You see it in the upper room. You have a, there's an expectation. He said, you guys wait for the Spirit. Go and pray. And the 120 got together and prayed. I've been in a room that was supposedly the upper room where they were. And there's just an, a, great, a great anticipation. It, it, it's nostalgic. It's, it's a historical place. And, and I don't know if it's really the right place. Nobody really knows. But it was a place like that. And there was an upper room. It was upstairs. And that's where they went. And that there's, there's an expectation that they had. Listen. Jesus said, go and pray, and they did, and he answered their prayers. In fact, he did things beyond what they expected. And so we, as a congregation, must pray together. And tonight is a great opportunity. At 6.30 tonight, we'll gather together. I hope we have 120, like they did here, more than likely more. And we will pray. We will pray as Jesus taught us. Scripture fed worship-based, spirit-led praying. And we will pray in his model of the Lord's Prayer of the four by four of praise and response and repent and then asking and yielding. And we will do this all together. And as soon as we're done doing it together, the major uh, major blocks of ministry will be around the room. Like we will have men's ministry and women's ministry and children's ministry and missions and all these different ministries that'll be grouped. And you will choose to go to a different section around this room, they will lay, we will lay out the request before the Lord and we will ask the Lord to do things and we will worship Him. Here's why we do this. Jesus is the chief shepherd of the church, right? We don't want to be like any other church. We just want to follow what Jesus tells us to do according to Scripture, right? And, and we want to do what He tells us to do. And we want to do it within his power as he commands and he leads. And it takes the body to do this. It's, it's not like the staff goes into another room and you wait till smoke comes out the top and then we come out with decisions. It doesn't work like that. God works among us. It's the priesthood of the believer. It's you and me. Now you say, look, I, I don't like to pray out loud. Then don't. But just come tonight. And you, you can sit and you, can, you will pray though. And you will listen. And you'll be saying amen to the many other people who pray. And I hope that you come back tonight. Also, we're doing 21 days of prayer starting tomorrow. And there's a little booklet in the back. You can go and grab it. I think it's $5. And if you don't have the money, just just take it. That's okay. Um, And you follow the daily devotions every single day, realizing that we're all praying together. And we're all being devoted together because that's what the body of Christ does. And it's powerful. More than likely, you'll be here a year from now, right? 12 months from now. What kind of person will you be 12 months from now? What will your family be like? What will our church be like? What is God going to be doing over the next 52 weeks that will be radical and change us? I mean, raise your expectation for what God can do in our lives expect great things for God, attempt great things for God, and see what He can do in your life. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and thank you that we have an opportunity just to gather around the Bible and just to have you speak to us in a powerful way. Lord, I pray that you change our lives and make us more and more like you. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be more profound more powerful in our midst, in our private lives, in our family lives, and that the fruit of your spirit would abound. Lord, that we would be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, and we would be bold about sharing the name of Christ. Lord, transform us day by day into the church that you have in mind, that we surrender to you in all ways. And Lord, we love you. If you're here today, Maybe this is a new concept of the kingdom of God, of the love of God, of the forgiveness of sins. Maybe you've never heard this. Listen, this is for you. The Lord loves you. He sent his son to die for you. He rose from the dead to demonstrate his power, his glory, 
his kingship and his forgiveness for you and for me. And if you repent of sins and turn to him, he'll let you become a part of his kingdom, have eternal life. And this is for you and for me. Father, we pray that if there's any burdens that need to be lifted, you would lift them. Any bodies that you desire to heal, that you would heal them. And Lord, that we would walk closely to you in all things. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and let's worship the name of Jesus.
God bless you guys. You guys have a great week. You are just missed. Go and walk with the Lord.